As I was walking in the park today, I came across this beautiful white goose, which reminded me of the legend of the Swan Maiden, a mythical princess which shapeshifts from human form to swan form. There are several versions of this folktale around Europe which carry a deep symbolic significance and also got me thinking about Valkyries from Norse mythology, which are female figures that are often connected to swans and can fly, mentioned in Icelandic sagas, which were mostly written or compiled in the 13th century. While I've already spoken about pre-Columbian Viking expeditions to North America in previous videos, which I'll leave a link to in the description. In today's episode, I thought we would examine some lesser known Viking voyages, this time to South America. Academic historians generally do not admit to the presence of European visitors to South America until after the arrival of Christopher Columbus. That said, the most striking evidence for the Danish Viking presence in South America before the time of Columbus is the case of the Inca dogs. It's the custom of pre-conquest Incas to be mummified with their dogs. A study of the graves near Lima in 1885 distinguished a variety of herding dogs whose DNA samples taken later from 42 canine mummies did not match the dogs currently inhabiting the region. The analysis by French scientists determined that the mummified breed could not possibly be a descendant of the wild dogs of South America and instead matched it to dogs which numerous skeletal remains have been discovered all on the Danish islands of Als in the Baltic Sea. The French scientists were in no doubt that the mummified pre-conquest Inca dogs must be descendants of the Danish sheepdog. The difficulty presented was accounting for how these Danish dogs got to South America before the Spanish conquest. There were two theories for this. The first presented by scientists said that, quote, the Danish Vikings must have been given some of their bunzo sheepdogs to Norwegian Vikings. These Norwegian Vikings must have taken the dogs with them to North American colony at Vineland. When the Norwegians on Vineland were ejected by the natives, they must have left the dogs behind. The native Indians must have not wanted the dogs, but instead of killing them, crossed the water from Vineland to modern Canada, where they must have given the dogs to other tribes. These other tribes must also not have wanted to keep the dogs, and so pass them to yet more tribes to the south, the process being repeated down through the thousands of miles from the present United States, and onwards to Mexico, and then to tribe after tribe through Guatemala to Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, then Panama, from where they were conveyed by balsa raft to Venezuela, then along the coastal strips of Colombia and Ecuador, and up into the mountain heights of Peru, where the Inca adopted the entire strain. No evidence is offered to support this unlikely theory. This nonsensical explanation was the only scientific theory available, that is, that would fit in with the accepted history of the finding of the Americas. But if that account were wrong, a more common sense explanation might be that the Danish Vikings brought the dogs with them when they sailed to South America from Europe in the 11th century, and it is this idea which we will explore a bit further. In the 11th century, the Danish King Knut II had 1,700 ships for the western expansion. For the greater distances involved, a special type of woolen sail, which had been developed for greater speed and sailing, was used. They allegedly came ashore at Santos, Brazil, found the path which had long been previously prepared, and made their way on foot to the modern town of Pedro Juan Caballero in Paraguay, near the mountain Itaguambape, which means fortress. Long before the supposed arrival of the Vikings, it had been hollowed out to make a fortress, hence its name. The total of engraved runic inscriptions in Paraguay runs in the thousands and exceeds that of all of Scandinavia. 
71 have been translated from the South American Futhork dialect. One five-letter runic inscription was found inside the mountain fortress, but has defied translation. Not many people have heard of this possibility because the archaeological research supporting it was conducted around the time of the Second World War and involved the German nationalists. And so like most things that involves nationalist Germany, it was covered up and lied about in both politically motivated academia and by the banker-controlled media. French archaeologist Jacques de Mayou served in the Second World War as an officer with the 33rd Waffen SS Grenadier Division Charlemagne. After emigrating to Argentina post-war, he wrote several books on his research into the Viking presence along the coast of Latin and South America. The most important of these books for physical evidence of the Viking presence is called El Rey del Paraguay. It would appear that the purpose of the presence of Danish Vikings in Paraguay between the years 1000 and 1250 was to guard an installation of great importance. In May 1940, Fritz Berger, an engineer with contacts in Munich but working for the Army of Paraguay, was involved in an archaeological project involving a small mount about 130 feet in elevation known as Iviti Pero, which means Bald Mountain, located about 15 miles southeast of the modern border town of Pedro Juan Caballero. Early in 1942, when they had excavated a shaft 75 feet down inside the mountain, they came upon an object impossible to penetrate by drilling or explosives, apparently the roof of an enormous subterranean chamber. Work was suspended while awaiting advanced drilling equipment and more powerful explosives to be sent from Germany. In November of 1942, U.S. agents reported the arrival of a German U-boat at the Argentine naval base, which allegedly contained a pneumatic drill and explosives, after which excavation work continued immediately at Eviti Pero and continued into 1944 when, according to French archaeologist Jacques de Menu, the drillers were finally defeated by, quote, a definitely artificial material harder than reinforced concrete and unknown to science. Soundings within the mountain provided the dimensions of a suspected burial chambers of 666 feet by 260 feet of hollow structure with perhaps 800 rooms. De Mayu considered it to be the burial chamber of the great white king Iper, after whom Iviti Peru is now named, and other royalty from Tiwanaku, the ancient Bolivian town on the shores of Lake Titicaca, believed to have been in existence for more than 14,000 years. Iviti Peru, or Bald Mountain, seems to be what the Danish Vikings were protecting for perhaps three centuries. The initial interest of the Danish Vikings in South America was not Paraguay, but Bolivia. From a fortified hill near the Brazilian border, they occupied a defensive position for some part of two centuries, keeping watch on a nearby small mountain. Beneath the mountain, under observation, was not only a large area whose walls and roof were built of concrete unknown to science that could not be opened, but is also believed to conceal a network of deep subterranean tunnels. Strangely, for Europeans so far from home in the 11th century, they seemed to know exactly where they were heading and how to get there cross-country. There's substantial archaeological evidence that Vikings of Danish origin were present in Brazil, Bolivia, and Paraguay before Columbus and that they arrived by sea from Europe. While much of this evidence is segregated by the post-World War II scientific community because of Professor de Meus having been a member of the Waffen-SS, it is also ignored or concealed because of the ancient myths which support the physical evidence, such as the legend of the White King of Amambay. Quote, 
In those days there reigned in this region a powerful and wise king called Ypur. He was white and wore a long blonde beard. With men of his race and Indian warriors loyal to him, he lived in a community situated on the crest of a mountain. He possessed fearsome weapons and had immense riches in gold and silver. One day, however, he was attacked by savage tribes and disappeared forever. That is what my father told me, who had heard it from his father. King Ipper was never identified and his followers disappeared and there's no suggestions that they were massacred. So speculation continues as to what happened to them with some locals saying they escaped to somewhere below the ground. Letters sent to Munich mention tunnels discovered in the area 130 kilometers long, which is about 81 miles as well as drawn up plans of the subterranean installations and sketches of four tunnels, including careful measurements, but insufficient information to identify the locations of the various entrances. This area is inaccessible today as a military area. So in conclusion, combining legend, archeological and possibly runic evidence and nationalist socialist involvement this theory suggests that long before the 11th century, a rich and powerful white-skinned and blonde-haired king, Ipper, and his followers, unknown to the world's historians, inhabited the crest of the mountain fortress, and when attacked by an overwhelming force of natives, Ipper and his court retired to safety below Bald Mountain. Perhaps the Vikings were sent to Amun Bay later to protect and oversee the installation of the impenetrable concrete roof and sides over the portal below Bald Mountain. What is interesting about this story is that all the main actors are hiding something. All academic historians and scientists, some knowingly, adhere to the apparent lie that no European reached Southern America before Columbus in 1942. Therefore, no Vikings could have been there. I find this absurd, as in my own anthropological research, I found that the sites in South America predate, that is to say, are older than archaeological sites in North America, which goes directly against the proposed theory for how the New World was populated by people crossing the Bering Bridge near Alaska. That said, the Third Reich was in the middle of a major war which it was already in danger of losing. Its outcome depended on the Battle of the Atlantic, yet they somehow managed to spare a U-boat to detour to Argentina with a pneumatic drill for an archaeological dig in Paraguay? This sounds unreasonable that in 1942, Germany would do such a thing in the name of archaeology or to simply learn about King Ypres. So it sounds to reason that in light of the German involvement with Antarctica, which I've discussed many times in my videos concerning Operation High Jump and German subterranean bases and their quest to reach Agartha, a legendary inhabited world below the surface of the earth, that the Germans wanted to know where the tunnel beneath Bald Mountain led. Was the mountain one of the portals into the Vril world, the inner earth? There is much more to this story, which is only getting started, and I promise I will tie it all together soon in a follow-up video. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon. My books make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through Patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those who are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts, so please leave a comment below. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.
I've been spending a lot of time walking along the beach this summer, just reflecting. And on this particular day, looking out at the wide expanse of ocean, I got to wondering about what it must have been like for the early settlers to the Americas, especially those that arrived by ship. While it is likely that some Native American ancestry is derived from Asian people walking across a land bridge across Alaska, this is only part of the story, as these same Asian people probably also came on boats, sailing along the coastline of the Pacific Ocean, as we know the Vikings did across the Atlantic Ocean. Of course, the Vikings did it before Columbus, but the Vikings were not the first to cross the Atlantic, as Europeans, called the Solutrians, did it many thousands of years earlier, as did a group called the Red Paint People, who reached Newfoundland as well. And there's even evidence that the Phoenicians made it to the New World during the Bronze Age, which I've covered in a prior video. But what about the early Irish? Did ancient Celts from Ireland also make the voyage to the Americas? That's the topic of today's episode. Oham is an alphabet which was traditionally used to write primitive Irish 1600 years ago, the earliest known form of Gaelic. One theory suggests that Oham was first created as a cryptic alphabet designed by the Irish so as not to be understood by those with knowledge of the Latin alphabet, possibly created by Druids for political, military, or religious reasons to provide a secret means of communication in opposition to the authorities of Roman Britain. The Roman Empire ruled over southern Britain, and as I've outlined in a previous video, which I'll include a link to in the description, is where we get the legend of St. Patrick driving the snakes out of Ireland, as there were never any snakes found in Ireland, and so the story represents the expulsion and conversion of Ireland by the Roman Church via British mercenary forces, where the serpent represented paganism. I can't say for sure if this theory regarding the desire to keep communication secret by the Irish was the actual motivation for the original creation of the Oham alphabet, but it does seem like a useful advantage, especially in later years when it was the Irish that were invading parts of Britain. There are roughly 400 surviving Orthodox inscriptions on stone monuments throughout Ireland and Western Britain. The vast majority of the inscriptions consist of personal names. That said, there are myths that propose an earlier linguistic introduction into Europe, such as the 11th century Irish folklore in the form of a book of poetry called The Book of the Taking of Ireland, also known as The Book of Invasions, explains that Oham was first invented soon after the fall of the Tower of Babel, along with the Gaelic language by the legendary Scythian king Phineas Farsa. Phineas Farsa was great-grandson to Japhet, one of Noah's three sons. Japhet, incidentally, is known to the Romans as Jupiter, after which the planet is named, and genetically speaking, is considered father or ancestor of the Indo-European or Aryan people, who in Christianity is called Saint Peter. The ancient Irish Celts and Britons outline their royal houses from Japheth. According to the legend, Phineas journeyed from Scythia with 72 scholars to Mesopotamia to study the confused languages at Nimrod's tower, which is also known as the Tower of Babel. Finding that they had already been dispersed, Phineas sent his scholars to study them, and after 10 years, the investigations were complete and Phineas created what is known as the selected language, taking the best parts of each of the confused tongues and developed Oham as a perfect writing system for his language. Phineas Farsa had a son called Nell, whose wife, Irish history records as Scotta, an Egyptian princess, daughter of a pharaoh, from where Scotland gets its name. I made a very popular video on this topic with over a million views and there should be a link in the description if you'd like to see it. The son of Nell and Scotta was called Goidel, and it was he who, after the destruction of the Great Tower and the curse of the confusion of tongues, 
gave his name to a new language called Gaelic. The deeper occult meaning of this legend speaks to the ancient use of this language in sacred rituals and magic ceremonies, centered around solstices and equinoxes for the purpose of divination. Each letter is associated with a tree or other plant and meanings are derived from them. The divination rituals also involve some adult activities which some might find offensive. So for today's presentation, I'll focus on the anthropological aspects of Oham, as it has also been found in other distant parts of the planet, namely across the ocean in the New World. Could there be an ancient pre-Viking connection between Ireland and West Virginia that academia has suppressed? In 1989, archaeologist Robert Pyle discovered remains of a human skeleton in a rock shelter at the Cook Petroglyph site in Wyoming County, West Virginia. According to Pyle, the skull was sufficiently preserved to recognize a unique brachiocephalic or round-headed feature indicating a possible European origin. Mitochondrial DNA was extracted from the roots of the teeth and compared to previously cataloged DNA sequences from ethnic groups around the world. Radiocarbon dating conducted on a sample established the age of the remains at 1,300 years old, which would mean it died centuries before the accepted arrival of the Vikings in Newfoundland and 800 years before Columbus. The combined data from DNA and carbon testing established the presence of a person of European origin in southern West Virginia around the year 710 AD, the earliest date that a European has been positively identified on the North American continent through genetic data. That said, could the man have been an ancient Celt? In addition to the skeletal remains, Pilot found Oham petroglyphs on an ancient bone needle not far from the site. Examination concluded that the bone was very old. Scientists dated it to 2300 BC, but the markings on the needle were created sometime around the 5th or 6th century AD. Pyle suspected the bone needle had been left by ancient Celts from Ireland, so Pyle decided to travel to Ireland, where experts in Oham from Ireland and University of Maryland stated the artifact was genuine. According to Dr. William Grant from Edinburgh University, Scotland, and Dr. John Grant from Oakland, Maryland, both Celtic linguistic scholars who participated in Pyle's Oham research in southern West Virginia there was no doubt that the artifact was authentic, archaic Oham. Nevertheless, many scholars were not impressed and most simply laughed it off or ignored the controversial artifact, pretending it never existed. That said, this wasn't the only example of Oham in the Americas, as similar discoveries were made in Colorado. From the dawn of time, wherever man has gone, he's left his mark, literally. He's scratched, hacked, and scraped his lines, circles, and squiggles on the nearest thing at hand, usually rocks. What he's also left behind is a bunch of experts, all of them arguing about just what he meant by those marks, and also arguing about who made them and where the people came from, and how their theories contradict other forms of history. Our science specialist, Eve Savory, takes us on a rocky tour of those marks, or petroglyphs, as the experts usually call them. It's dawn on an autumn equinox in Colorado. As the shadow of this rock falls where what might be an ancient European language seems to predict it should, these people say our view of history is being challenged. If what we're saying here is true, it means that the history that we all learn in school, and that is accepted as as a reasonable facsimile of history, turns out to be wrong in very important points. The Vikings who built this settlement in Newfoundland a thousand years ago are generally believed to be the first Europeans to see North America. But some people think Europeans were here long before that. This is a petroglyph of a very old ship. 
It's made in the style that was used to draw ships on the rocks in Sweden. Scott Monaghan, an independent film producer, followed a small group of linguists and amateur archaeologists. They took him to sites they say prove Europeans were here perhaps 2,000 years before Columbus. This is their theory. Ancient seafarers of Europe and North Africa, at first blown off course by storms, reached North America and soon were trading far inland. These were bold navigators who crossed the oceans, settled here, intermarried with whatever people were here before, and their descendants are the modern American Indians. The shape of this is rather interesting. Archaeologists say Indians sharpening tools made these marks found at numerous locations. This man says no, it's a language. You see the two strokes over there, that's a D. A language known as Ogre, ancient Celtic. This is how it looks in the 12th century Book of Ballymote. It is these seasonal measurings predicting equinoxes and solstices that have the group excited because at six sites the Ogham translations are proving accurate. As well, the group says it finds references to the European zodiac, the twins, Gemini. And here they see Anubis, the Egyptian god of darkness, worshipped in pre-Christian times. E. Savory, CBC News. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon. My books make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those who are interested. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts, so please leave a comment below. Please have a wonderful week and I hope to see you again soon.